so let's start the today's se session. Uh, it's about network data enrichment for analysis uh, and hunting. The, our first speaker is Adam Pompre. Uh, he is a director of professional services at Bricata. Uh, he analyzes threat, trends, develop network monitoring and threat detection content and works on Bricata cybersecurity system. Adam has been in cybersecurity for last 16 plus years. Uh, and it would be an interesting talk I look forward to. So, Adam. Thank you. Thanks, Ashish. Appreciate that. Great talk yesterday, by the way. It was good stuff. Uh, let me just swap this. See my mouse over there. And tell me if I'm on the swap displays button. Sorry about that. All right, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back. I uh, hope everybody was able to get out in, into DC last night and, and check out the town. Um, as Ashish said, I've been in network defense uh, for a number of years now, most of which has been here um, in the DC area, Northern Virginia, uh, supporting the federal government as a, as a contractor mostly, um, but now I'm on the commercial side, as, as Ashish mentioned. Um, throughout that time, I've, I've learned a lot, and I've also learned how much I, I don't know, which is something that I seem to kind of continuously discover. Um, but I'm here today to talk about some of the, the challenges that we face as network defenders, and um, it's something that I, I kind of deal with on a regular basis, and, and I've kind of taken, taken it upon myself to, to look for solutions to solve some of these problems that I'll talk about. Um, and that resulted in a bro module that I, I'm making available today. And uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about some of the use cases for that module. So, show, quick show of hands, seen the MITRE ATT&CK matrix? Awesome, yeah. And if you haven't checked it out, I, I highly recommend you do so. It's a, uh, it's a culmination of a lot of great research and analysis, uh, incident response work. Um, it's pulled together uh, uh, threat indicators um, that are available uh, for, for your consumption kind of freely. Um, it's, it's really well organized and, and really made, made so that it's understandable and accessible to uh, network defenders, um, those that are they're trying to understand the, the variety of, of techniques that the actors have, threat actors have available to them. And as all we, we all know, there are lots and lots of options out there for the bad guys. Uh, so kind of what you see here is the, the 11 tactics laid out across the, the header row. And you can kind of think kill chain here from you know, uh, reconnaissance on the left side, initial access, excuse me, uh, all the way over to command and control on the right. Uh, within each of these columns is a series of, of techniques that kind of fall in that category. And what's really nice about this matrix is that you can drill into these things and get into the, the nitty gritty, get into the details. And this is kind of uh, just one little snippet of some of that, that information that these folks have been able to capture for us. And it gives you some great technical details about the technique itself, um, things that you need, data sources that you need to, to not only carry out the technique, but also detect it. And then if you get down into the details a little further, there's some, some guidance on how to detect it, uh, specific guidance on how to detect it. But as you go through these uh, techniques, you start to realize that four of these categories, and sorry, that thing should have disappeared there. Uh, four of these tactic categories are, are primarily network oriented. And, and these are, this is a space that we can play in, you know, uh, as network traffic analysts and, and network defenders. Um, most of the, the other things are, are, are highly endpoint oriented. But as you dive into these techniques, you start to, to kind of come away with some common themes. And one of those is that you have to be able to kind of understand and, and, and identify abnormal system behavior. And that, that's a hard problem to solve for us, right? Uh, there's threat hunting techniques that, that can help, 
But generally speaking, you have to have a really strong understanding of the environment that you're working in and the hosts that are involved in the communication, the users that interact with those hosts, the systems, or the, the uh, clients, uh, client applications and services that are in use. Uh, there's a lot of things at play, and, and that's, that's kind of a daunting task, especially when you're, you're deploying into a new environment and don't know much about the lay of the land. But it, it presents an interesting challenge for us analysts, right? We have to understand the threat landscape, the attack surface, our exposure points in, in the environment, um, all the things that are relevant to, to network defense, in addition to understanding how the hosts in our environment behave. And, that, and that's, a, that's a tall order for, for any one individual. That, that knowledge is, it, you kind of accrue it over time. It's, it's not something that somebody is just gonna hand you when you walk in the door. And it's difficult to retain, people come and go. So it's, it's kind of difficult to pass along. <clears throat> to kind of look at this a, a little bit differently, this is a, a chart that I threw up um, a number of years ago to kind of qualify this problem, quantify this problem uh, for the organization that I was working for at the time. And I just went through a, a short exercise to kind of try to identify and, and, and label um, communications in the environment that I, that I knew and understood and then I, that I could explain to someone else. And as you can see, you know, Generally speaking, when I, when I set out down this path, I was somewhere between five and 20% of the overall volume I, I could claim some, some knowledge and understanding of. And that's not great when we threat hunters want to, to deal in the unknown. That, that's a, a really big sandbox to play in there, right? Of course, you know, once you, you start to, to go down this path and, and analyze this traffic, things get better over time. You start to learn, and not only do you learn, you start to learn more rapidly, right? You, you understand the systems, the, the people to ask about the particular host or network segments, understand the, the information repositories that you have access to and, and how to get to them, and, and that workflow kind of, kind of shortens. Things continue to improve over time, and, and even at a, a faster pace, and the threat hunters have a, a very, uh, a more narrow sandbox, a smaller sandbox to play in which is great. It, they can be far more effective in, in if, we, if we shrink that world a little bit. But then eventually the inevitable happens, analyst leaves the team, and we all get collectively a little dumber because uh, somebody you know, took a better job. So not only is this the security team's problem, this also is the organization's problem. Now the, the effectiveness of their network defense program has suffered a little bit because somebody took a better job and, and with them left their experience and knowledge. That all the, those uh, important things that they've accrued over time since they joined the team. So how does an organization deal with this? And how can you, you kind of reduce that, that individual human factor in, in this overall problem, right? Well, I think network data enrichment and data enrichment is, in general is, is one way to, to tackle this. And this is a, a, a quick definition that I scraped off of Wikipedia here. But it's the action of, enrichment is the action of improving or enhancing the quality or value of something. And that's exactly what I'm talking about, is taking some of the, the context, the contextual knowledge, institutional knowledge that we pull together and, and we accrue over time as analysts and kind of rolling that back into the tool. So, you know, it's, it's it's pretty clear, you know, the previous slides have kind of illustrated that, you know, you need to know what's normal and what, what is expected in order to be able to determine what's not. And, but there's other things that, that having this addi additional knowledge kind of helps with. And, and I was just talking about the, the workflows where you're, you're reviewing uh, network traffic data and maybe you go hit your knowledge base or you've got a spreadsheet or a note file somewhere where you've gotten those notes from previous investigations. If that data is, is enriched already, then you might be able to cut down the time on those manual workflows. And then there's also that, that new analyst that takes the place of the person that you know, got a raise and, and moved on. You can kind of shrink, shrink that learning curve a little bit and cut down, to that, cut down that ramp up time. But one thing I really like about this, this technique is that it, it enables informed analysis. When you're looking at raw traffic, if you have 
some, some additional context around the host involved or the communications involved, then you can, you can come, come to some quicker, better informed conclusions about what you're looking at. And just to kind of highlight an example, can anybody tell me if this is a suspicious communication? First glance, probably not, and, and I wouldn't expect you to be able to. But if you knew a little bit more about the hosts involved, you know, say that the originating client, originating host was from a, a VPN pool, and the responding host was a you know production SQL server. Now, in some environments, this may be normal. I think it's kind of generally against best practice to do such things, allow such things. Um, so if you were to just know this this little bit of additional detail about the host involved in this communication, you can come to a, a much quicker conclusion about what's going on here. So all is not lost. There's plenty of methods of, of enriching our data today. Um, I've talked a little bit already about some of the manual processes out there. We've got our knowledge bases, our ticketing systems, spreadsheets, note files, that sort of thing. Um, there's also stuff that happens when, when our data kind of lands on disk. Uh, DB joins, lookup tables, and post-processing sort of things, uh, scripts that run against the data. Um, then this is kind of a, a, a newer and evolving area of enrichment, uh, data in transit. You've got your ETL stuff, your uh, streaming engines, and you also have some of the transport mechanisms like uh, Logstash that can do you know, real-time enrichment of the data that's in transit. But you notice there's nothing over here, intentionally, um, on this left side of the arrow. And this is where I think Zeek can play a major role. I mean, obviously, it's, it's tremendous, tremendous at uh, network traffic inspection. Um, it has the mechanisms we need to do this kind of enrichment. Um, the input framework, as she mentioned that yesterday, I'm also a big fan of the input framework. I think it, it has a lot of mer merit and a lot of value. And this kind of enrichment is actually being done within Bro in several other ways already. And I want to highlight some of that stuff right here. And then we'll kind of talk about the way, um, the way what I'm talking about differs a little bit. If you haven't used it, the Intel framework is, is fantastic. It's great. It's got 11 uh, native uh, indicators that are supported out of the box. And it's really easy to extend, as, as the guys on the uh, JA3 project have shown us. Um, they, they created a new signature for SSL clients. And you simply just add that as an indicator into the framework, and now you can consume that, that indicator type. And that's awesome. But another great thing about the, the Intel framework is that it provides additional context with those threat intelligence indicators. And for anybody that's ever worked with threat intel, you know that context is pretty important, right? The, the indicator without context has a lot less value to, to most people. So the, the source of the threat intel, that's actually a required field when you submit or, or insert new uh, indicators into the framework. Uh, but you can extend that. You can add other metadata, the actor, the campaign, the incident number, if it's, a, it's an indicator that you produce through an internal investigation. The Intel framework is fantastic, but it's specifically built for detecting the bad things. So that, that leaves us kind of wanting. There's, there's more. We have more knowledge. We have more, um, a lot more that we can do with the, the knowledge that we've accrued over time. Where can we put it? Well, the site module is another example of how uh, Bro does some kind of auto enrichment of network data. Uh, it uses the, the local nets and local zones variables. There's some auto enrichment of connection rec records that happens on your behalf. If you uh, take the step, and I would highly recommend you do this, take the step to define those variables accurately. Um, Bro is going to add the uh, local ridge and local rest fields to your connection records. And those fields are also used internally uh, to, to, um, by a variety of scripts um, that you can, you can infer a lot of logic just based on, on that kind of knowledge. There's also convenience functions that, that come with the, the Bro site module um, that allow you to, to kind of test this notion of locality um, in script land, which is incredibly useful. So it's, it provides a lot of great context, but we're kind of limited here. Uh, there's a lot of additional institutional knowledge, I think, that we can capture in these little bits of information and make it available inside of Bro and enrich our data with it. Um, the site module gets us close, but not all the way. So 
kind of working on this problem myself, I came up with this, uh, this is what I'm calling the flow labels module framework, whatever. Um, and it's essentially a central mechanism for, for collecting and ingesting that, that institutional knowledge in the form of, of little text labels, little short little strings, um, and making it available in script land, and, and then again enriching the data set with it. I break this down into two different kind of categories. One is static labeling. I'll talk to, talk to these in more detail in a second here. One is static labeling, and, and by that I mean simply that uh, there's a static input file. Uh, Bro reads that in and ingests those labels and then makes them associated with the, uh, the objects that, that they've been defined with. Um, and then there's dynamic labeling, which is kind of something that happens in, in real time um, while it, you know, from within a, a Bro analysis script, a policy script, let's say. Uh, let's say you're, you're collecting stats for a certain type of behavior, or, or you have a script that's looking for certain uh, communication conditions, uh, there's this notion of, of adding a dynamic label to the connection or, or to what I kind of refer to as a living profile for the IP address. So to get into static labels in a little more detail, you can kind of think, uh, I mean, there, there's short strings that describe the object, IP address or subnet, and you have your option there. Um, for environments, you know, you can where IP address ranges have been allocated to a particular systems with a particular functional role, maybe that's something that you can capture at a subnet level. But this is all very similar to environment variables, uh, not only that you might use in shell, but you see in other security tools. And for example, Suricata is one. Uh, hopefully this is legible, I can't really tell. Um, but Suricata variables capture a lot of context, and that context is, is kind of encoded in the, the variable name, right? And you got your home net, that's, that's almost synonymous with local nets in, in Broland, um, but we break it down a little further with SQL servers, HTTP servers, SMTP servers, those sorts of things, right? And there's a lot of additional context that you can just pull out of the, the variable name itself. You know, you know, based on how you define this, that that host in, in that subnet or this series of addresses all are related in this, this way. Now, I would not recommend uh, running with the defaults like this. You know, it's, it's not, you're not helping yourself by leaving, leaving these uh, things loosely defined. Not every host in the environment is gonna act like a SQL server, so you might wanna get a little more granular than that. But the, the site module and as I mentioned, the local nets variable kind of, kind of does the same thing. It captures this notion of, of locality uh, when it comes to IP addresses and subnets. And this is, this is exactly how the, the local nets variable is declared by the site module. It's just a set of strings. Or, excuse me, a set of subnet. Um, and if, when you want to add values to that set, you typically use a redef statement. You could use an add statement if you want, um, but you could use a redef statement to populate it with the, the addresses, the subnets, excuse me, that, uh, that, that belong there. And not everybody uses RFC 1918, but most of us do internally. Um, but generally speaking, this is, this is how it's done. So what's, what's happening here is the, the context is, is encoded in, in the variable name, local nets, and that, that context is being associated with these subnets by adding them to that set. So what if we flip this around a little bit? What if we, we use the subnets themselves as the object and we label it, we associate that local label with those subnets? And, and this uh, is functionally the same as, as the site local nets variable, but what this allows us to do is expand on the attributes, the labels that are associated with those subnets. And we get this, this one-to-many relationship now, whereas before with local nets, it's one variable list of subnets. So this, this has some pretty big implications. And not only that, it gives us a kind of a way to, to control this contextual knowledge and keep it in one place. Uh, you know, like we were talking about yesterday, we have constants, the little configurable things um, and built into our scripts. A lot of the time, like Ashish was saying yesterday, you might want to include a list of subnets or IP addresses or things that, that mean something to you in some way. Maybe the, you, you want to whitelist them in your script or, or blacklist them or what have you. 
Um, but what you end up with, if you go down that path, and I, and I do it myself, and I'm not saying it's wrong or anything, um, but you have this, these little bits of knowledge all scattered throughout your scripts all over the place. And, and you might be using an IP address or a subnet in one script and using it in a similar way in another script, but they're, it's located in two different variables. And this is kind of a, just kind of flipping that around a little bit and saying this can all reside in, in one spot. So here are some examples of, of the kinds of labels that I, I like to associate with, with IP addresses or ciders. And you've got the, the notion of locality there. Uh, local is one. That could be internal, external, DMZ, whatever. Um, and then the, the network segment, the uh, production, dev, web services. And there's lots of ways you can expand on this. And this is kind of where you, your imagination can come into play. You can, you can go any direction you want here. Environment type, criticality, or excuse me, asset value. Uh, the functional role of the host, I think, is incredibly important to be aware of. Um, you know, if a database servers don't act like web servers and they don't act like workstations and just that little bit of information can, can get you a long way down the path to figuring out what's going on there. So a couple of examples here and I, I don't think this is an all-inclusive list by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, there's lots of ways we could expand on this. So again, this is, this is kind of what I refer to as static labels, and it's, it's static because it's, a, it's just a, a, a TSV file, a, a tab delimited file. Uh, simply put, it's uh, two, two columns. You get your addresses on, on the left and your labels on the right. Uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, not a TSV file. This is actually an Excel spreadsheet. And if you've ever tried to hand jam a, a TSV file in a text editor or, or in VI, you probably had some similar frustrations that I've had. Um, so I, I, you know, just to make it easy on myself, I, I use this Excel template and, and just remember to delete that left cell before I save it off. And it'll, it'll be ingested by a bro just fine. So that's an example or, or just a, a quick shot of, of what the, the static CIDR labels file looks like. Um, talk quickly about the, the static flow labels. So um, I, I saw the need to be able to kind of uh, label connections. And you know, the, the, the flow tuple or the five tuple is, is certainly one way to, to kind of identify a flow. But I think there's more. I think there's, there's a, additional ways we can describe flows that are independent of unique sessions. And if you uh, hopefully have heard of the producer-consumer ratio, it's a fantastic metric for kind of measuring data flow. And as it's defined, it's measuring data flow independent of size and rate. Um, so it, it, what we can do is kind of infer if, if the originator was sending or receiving, and who's pitching and who's catching, right? And thinking in terms of uh, baseball, of course. Uh, but the, uh, we just use some simple directional indicators um, to, to designate uh, if the data flow is originator to responder, responder to originator, or uh, are generally equal between the two. Um, so this, these, these attributes, the, the five tuple fields and the directional indicator are available to you to kind of describe flows in this uh, static flow labels file. So um, in addition to defining the flow, there's a, a, a kind of built in a variety of ways to label it. Um, and I think these things kind of apply universally when it comes to network traffic analysis. Uh, the first is the first couple or first three here are Boolean fields, true or false. Um, the first is known. Have you seen the flow? Have you analyzed the flow? Have you made a determination, yes or no? I, I'm aware of what this is. And generally speaking, if, if it makes its way into this input file, then you've gone through the exercise of, of analyzing the traffic, figuring out good or bad. Uh, you know, at this point, you know what it is, right? Um, so generally speaking, that's going to be true. Authorized is a little bit of a different story. Uh, this comes down to what your organization's policy says. Should this be happening? Is this allowed? And then there's suspicious. We all know what suspicious means. Um, when we're defining the, this, these static flow labels, um, suspicious, you know, you have to have a known bad in order to be able to, to accurately label uh, a flow uh, suspicious. So uh, this, this is more applicable in kind of uh, closed test environments when you're working with a known data set and you're, you want to label those. And then finally, there's the labels field, which is, uh, you know, again, just a list of short strings that, that describe that communication. 
And to just give you an example of what that looks like, again, in a kind of an Excel template file. You got your protocol on the left, your originating host, the data flow direction based on PCR, responding host, port, known, authorized, labels, and suspicious. Um, I, w I do want to mention here that you know you have available to you the, the five tuple fields and the PCR, but not all of them are required. You can use those fields in, in kind of any combination. The only requirement is that you have an IP address in the originating host or responding host position. So you could define all five tuple fields and a PCR, or you could say all traffic originating from this host going to this port is, is a flow of a particular type. You can kind of generalize in that way. So you're not limited to, you know, and of course, if you include the originating port, uh, things get pretty granular quickly. So uh, that, that doesn't always work. So what's going on behind the scenes? Um, well, as was mentioned yesterday, uh, Bro was reading this information into tables. And as I illustrated a, a few slides back, these labels are being stored in a set. So they're stored, only unique values are stored. Everything is converted to lowercase. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, and it, it allows for pretty easy matching in real time. Um, all of this information is available to you in BroScript, um, you know, in your event handlers. So you can you know, handle an event, use a, one of the convenience functions that are supplied, check to see if a label exists or return all the labels that are associated with a given IP or, or subnet, and then use it however you, you see fit. Um, I think this, uh, this, again, the input framework is, is really cool and useful in a lot of different ways. And a great example of how this is done is at this URL right here. A uh, very simple example about reading data from the, the Bro native tab delimited format into tables and making use of that information. So over on the right there is just a kind of an excerpt of what um, a labeled connection would look like. And of course, this is JSON, just so it's a little easier to read. Uh, but you essentially have a labels, labels field and, and some subfields, a ridge and resp. And those would be the labels that are associated with, with those, uh, those objects uh, of the connection. And it's just a list of, of terms, as I was describing before. So interacting with this stuff in BroScript um, it's pretty straightforward uh, if you're familiar with working with data in bro tables, uh, excuse me, Zeek tables. I don't know how many times I made that mistake already. Uh, but I've provided a couple of convenient functions to make this a little bit easier. Uh, the first is IP has labels. So very simply put, uh, you, you pass it an IP address and then a, a set of a unique list of labels and it's gonna tell you true or false if all of those labels exist or have been associated with that IP address. Get flow labels and get cider labels are what they kind of sound like. Um, you pass them the argument and they return the list of labels that have been associated. And then add IP labels here at the bottom is a way that you can dynamically uh, label connections or IP addresses in kind of real time and, and contribute to that like building uh, living profile as I was describing it before. So uh, just to talk a little bit more about dynamic labels, um, this is not a, a novel thing, but it's just kind of a different way to do it, right? Um, it's, it's used for, you know, you write a bro script, um, it performs some analysis on live traffic, and then can add one of these labels back into this, what I refer to as the knowledge base. The entries in that knowledge base have a limited lifespan. They only sit there for 11 minutes. Why 11? Because 11 is better than 10, as Spinal, Spinal Tap taught us years ago. <laughs> Um, they have a limited lifespan, but what that kind of allows you to do is kind of build a, a, a behavioral profile, and it's, it's kind of a, a sliding window, right? That, that, that window of time is 11 minutes wide all the time, but it's moving forward. Um, but as you kind of accumulate these things, uh, depending on, on the scripts that you're writing, you can start to, to really understand what's going on with the host. And if, if you have the right scripts in place and they're making the right observations, then you can, you can see you know, uh, a host is compromised and exhibiting all of these behaviors um, that are you know, kind of confirmed that this compromise has been successful and, and things are happening. You know, actors are, are, are making things happen. So I'm gonna step through a couple of examples, uh, I think pretty straightforward and easy to understand examples of, of kind of what I'm talking about and, 
and using static labels and dynamic labels together, I think is, is kind of a powerful notion. And again, it's, it's not meant to be a replacement to, to using constants or, or generating notices or anything like that. I think this is, this is just a, a different way of doing things, right? It's just kind of the supplement and hopefully provide a, a central mechanism for, for managing these knowledge objects that, that we all kind of accrue uh, you know, just by doing our work. So the first example I wanted to talk about is Scan.bro. Everybody, most probably, are familiar with Scan.bro. Um, pretty simple approach, but I've, I've tried it, and it's, it's effective. It works. Um, there, there's obviously many, many, many ways to, to do scan detection, but this is one technique that works pretty well. But one thing in particular, we don't necessarily need to track scan, st scan statistics for hosts that should be performing scanning. And, and that, I think, is some, uh, some useful context that you know, we can kind of save on system resources and we can also save on, on analyst uh, you know, analysis time just by simply not putting this in front of them, right? So what we can do is check to see, use the IP has label function, check to see if this IP address has been labeled a scanner, just as an example. And if, if it has, we bail out. We don't do anything else. If it hasn't, then that's something that we're more interested in. That's a host that we don't expect to be exhibiting this kind of behavior. So we take it a little bit further and we get into the dynamic labeling side of things. Say we've, we've reached our threshold, we've count, counted the, the number of, of failed connection attempts from a given IP address, and we, we've determined that it's performing host scanning or port scanning. Well, we can add that dynamic label back to that IP profile and it'll stick to it for, for that 11 minutes. So it becomes kind of a living attribute of that host in that, that window of time. Another example, suspicious DNS server activity. We all know that there are particular systems in our environments that should be answering, responding to, and, and making gratuitous DNS requests um, you know, on behalf of our, our clients. Um, I think in most cases, these, these systems are, are pretty easy to identify in an environment. Uh, these are designated hosts or maybe even a designated subnet, uh, but these systems should be performing this activity. So to take this a step further, we could use labels like DNS resolver and local and check, for, check the, uh, respond, the hosts that are responding to DNS queries to see if they are local DNS resolvers. If they're not, then we might have a, DNS, a rogue DNS server in the environment, something that uh, is either you know, uh, knocked off a legitimate DNS resolver and, and, and kind of masquerading, or uh, maybe it's just a misconfiguration or somebody's not you know, following the change process and, or whatever. But it's something that is, is notable at this point. So we could add that rogue DNS server back, back to that, that living profile of that originating, or excuse me, of responding host. So the last example I, I wanted to uh, highlight here, and you know, there's, people ask you like, does Zeek detect lateral movement? And you just like, whoa, uh, did you see the list of techniques that are available, uh, known techniques, documented techniques that are available to threat actors to, to move around laterally in an environment? That's a, that's kind of a daunting question. But of course, there, there are ways to, to go about this. And, you know, some of them are, are listed down there at the bottom, you know, failing SMB authentication, uh, seeking out SMB administrator or Windows admin shares, share enumeration, things of these things, things of that nature. Uh, all of these behaviors are, are kind of part and parcel to lateral movement, and it is in particular in a Windows environment. But there's also systems that, that exhibit that kind of behavior that, that will generate those false alarms. And so the example here, IP has label, admin, admin LAN, scanners. Uh, things that, that we know are probably going to kick off these kinds of, of detections. We just don't, don't care about it. We're not going to worry about it. So all of those things set aside. We see this behavior. Now we can start to, to kind of with confidence add these labels back to the, the host responsible into that living profile and kind of build out an understanding of how this host is behaving in that window of time. So those are a couple of examples of how this, this enriched data, this labeled data, can be used inside of Bro. Uh, outside of Bro, it has a lot of, lot of uh, 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 utility as well, I believe. Um, if you know, working with labeled data in, in log analysis systems, you can use it for filtering, uh, gathering, 
aggregated uh, aggregations and statistics. Um, you want to count uh, the number of times your, your dev environment communicated with something in your production environment. Just by having this additional context in these records, you can start doing this sort of thing. So that, that becomes really useful. Policy enforcement kind of works the same way. Should dev systems ever be talking to production systems? You know, you can kind of validate your security controls doing this sort of thing. And of course, there's lots of enhanced correlations and heuristics you can build just on, on top of these, this additional context. Um, in, in the area that I'm just starting to play in is, is uh, labeling data for ingest and, and machine learning systems. Now, I'm not a data scientist. I'm just an analyst. You know, I, I, I don't know anything about data science. I think it's cool, and I think it has utility in our, in our field, in our space, uh, but I don't pretend to understand. Uh, but I do know that especially supervised systems can, can make use of, of accurately labeled data, and whether that's benign traffic, things that, that we know are no problem, like uh, Marcus was talking about in his keynote, or maybe it's malicious, malicious traffic, known bats. So there's a couple of different ways that can be used. Um, again, kind of the interplay between static and dynamic labels is, is something that I think can, can really provide some rich descriptors for this traffic. Uh, and then the, the known, and author, known and authorized attributes uh, there at the bottom can be really good for, for educating these systems about what known and authorized benign traffic looks like. And so enough of the, uh, the text. Uh, time for a couple of pr pretty pictures here. Uh, this is just a, a, a topo topological uh, graph that was put together using some bro data. And we use the labels to, uh, as categorical labels. So essentially what you're seeing here, the, the colors of these dots represent the operating systems that, um, that I included in that static input file. So uh, you can, just the way it's laid out here, you can kind of start seeing how hosts uh, are related. Th these dots represent communications, of course. Uh, how these hosts behave and, and are differ, uh, relate and differ from, from other operating systems. And we've also started to play with using this for, for training supervised models. And um, we've had a little bit of success here. And in this case, uh, we've got this little cluster over here of bot activity. And again, this was in a closed test environment, known data set, very easy to understand. And that was the whole point of the exercise. Um, but what we were happy to see was that these things popped out off to the side and were, were clustered accurately. So call that a win, right? So um, that's kind of where things stand today. Uh, I think the idea has merit. And you know, I, I, like I mentioned before, the, the code is going to be made available. It's available now. I'll share the, the URL here in a second. Um, but there's a lots, of, lots of ways to improve on this. And these are all kind of continu it's a continuous work, just like was said earlier in the week. This thing is never done. It's never finished. It's always going to, uh, there's room for improvement and corrections, I'm sure. Um, I'm, not, I'm not calling it end-all, be-all by any stretch. Um, but I use some of the, the label terms kind of consistently through the talk. And that notion of reserved labels, I think, is kind of important here because, you know, it's, it's kind of up to you, the user, to define what the labels are going to be. And you benefit if they're consistent. And you can kind of rely upon what, what the label for a particular use is going to be. So kind of establishing a, a standard of, of sorts, at least a, a reference model maybe, uh, would be a good, good way to go with this. And I think there's a lot of uh, expansion on use cases too. Again, how, how the kind of the, the static and dynamic side to the, the sides of the house here uh, kind of interplay. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot more that can be done there. And there's uh, some fingerprinting work that's going on right now and, and has been recently that I think would be uh, a great use of, of dynamic labels in this context. Um, so I want to start looking at that. And there's always just this, this, the code improvements in general, right? There's always room for improvement there. So as promised, uh, there's the uh, GitHub URL. And um, I submitted the PR this morning. So hopefully it'll be available as a, as a Zeek package uh, sometime in the very near future. That's all I've got. Thanks, folks. Any questions? Sir? Yeah, so the clustering algorithm, is that 
say it a little louder. I, th I believe it is k-means that that was actually done by a, a real data scientist yeah. uh, somebody a colleague that I've been working with recently so I can't speak to the, the, the details there but I believe it was k-means anybody else all right very good thanks for the time